Hey folks, Jim Blakely here, continuing our series called Clear Sight, where we've been um, looking at what uh, historically we've seen humanity, how we've seen humanity respond to difficult circumstances, to trials, tribulations. As we think about the what the pandemic has been for many of us, for most of us, has been some major disruption in our lives. And uh, in this series, Clear Sight, what we've been talking about is how you get that kind of clear sight after going through some major disruption, whether it's moving to a new uh, community altogether, you know, your schedule just wiped clean and uh, you get to see uh, that distance from some distance, you get to see what life was like uh, prior to making that move and what was satisfying, what was dissatisfying. Um, and you get to make some changes, you know, because you have some kind of clear sight as to uh, what, what works well and what doesn't. So we're prayerful that uh, coming out of this pandemic, that many of us, all of us really, will have some clear sight into uh, what has worked for us prior to COVID, what's worked well for us during COVID, and what hasn't. And that we would uh, very intentionally uh, take advantage of that information, that now it's turned it into wisdom, and uh, step into this next season coming out of COVID uh, with clear sight and uh, yeah, following you and your priorities for our lives, Lord. That yeah, I, I mean, I'm just even prayerfully saying, Lord, we 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 want to step into your vision, uh, your intention for all of our lives. So uh, that's what we're doing in this series. We've we've covered some ground about how to make good decisions, good godly decisions, uh, listening to God's voice. Uh, last week I talked about just leaning in or pressing into our relationship with God, making that a priority and what it looks like to uh, to step back into a more intentional relationship with God. And today I want to talk a little bit about community and about our relationships with each other. Uh, this week I was um, paying attention. I, I haven't paid a lot of attention, honestly, to baseball, uh, Major League Baseball through the years. Um, it's never been one of the sports I've cared uh, passionately about, um, but I follow every now and then. And um, some of you may know that I was born and raised in the Detroit, Michigan area. And uh, so my team is the Detroit Tigers. And uh, to be a Detroit sports fan in general right now is not, it's not a great time in our history to be a fan of any of the major sports. Um, and the Tigers, you know, they're, uh, they're at the bottom of the league. Um, but they're doing well lately, so that's exciting. But anyway, um, interesting thing is that uh, I had a chance this week to see, to watch, as one of the Detroit pitchers pitched a no-hitter. And for those who are unfamiliar with baseball, including myself, I'm not, uh, again, a huge fan, um, but this is only the seventh no-hitter that a Detroit Tigers pitcher has pitched in over 100 years. Seven times in over 100 years. Think about it. You know, they play... Uh, over a hundred games a year. Uh, now I don't know what they played back in the 30s and 40s, 50s, probably less than that. Um, but still, we're talking about thousands and thousands of baseball games over the years. And this is only the seventh time somebody has thrown a no-hitter. Pitched nine innings of baseball, full game, and not one hit from the opposing team. So pretty phenomenal. And as I watched that last pitch, uh, it was pretty, pretty great. You know, the, the pitcher throws the ball, the batter swings, misses, and uh, the pitcher just jumps up, kind of puts his hands up like, ah, oh, I did it, I made it, right? And immediately, uh, uh, all the players from the team, they, they come out to the, the pitching mound, they surround him, they're jumping up, they're high-fiving, they're hugging him, and they look like, they look like children. I mean, they're just dancing and jumping and excited. You know, they're doing the sorts of things that if you had just said, pulled one of those players aside on a normal day like this and said, hey, would you just stand here and jump for joy? Uh, they'd probably feel a little sheepish about that. That's kind of embarrassing. I don't want to do that sort of thing. But they're all, there's no inhibition. They're just genuinely excited for this pitcher, uh, for their team, for the implications, even the crowd. So this, this game took place in Seattle, not the Tigers' home home turf and even the crowd you can hear sort of cheering on this picture in the background because they just recognize like this is a great moment in his life it's it's uh it's something that's rare to see obviously only seven times in over 100 years so even the crowd seattle mariners fans are excited and happy for this tigers pitcher uh and you know it just it got me thinking especially in in the context of of wanting to uh, contemplate what it looks like for us to turn the corner out of COVID 
um, and what that looks like with regards to our relationships and community. And again, seeing this scene where everybody is so excited for this picture just got me thinking, well, maybe that's what, maybe that's what community is meant to be. Maybe we're, we're meant to feel the kind of feelings that this picture was feeling in that moment of triumph. Maybe we're meant to cheer each other on uh, as the team was cheering on this picture with no inhibition, you know, just jumping for joy, hugging, giving high fives. Like maybe that's a, a, a small picture of what community is meant to be like. You know, it's where everyone in that scene just dropped their fears of what people would think. They, um, they overlooked their own sense of, of, uh, of self-infatuation that many of us have. They, they were able to just drop all those pretenses, all those ideas, and just focus their energy and their joy and their enthusiasm and their encouragement on this one picture. And it got me thinking, what would that look like? You know, what would it look like for a Christian community to be that enthusiastic for each other, to love and care for and encourage each other in that kind of way, to know that when something goes right, when I've done something right, uh, when I have successfully resisted a temptation, or when I have stepped out in a way that God's called me, uh, what would it be like to know that there would be people around us that would cheer us on, that would give us high fives, that would hug us, that would be super excited for us, uh, and spur us toward those that love and those good deeds, and, and toward a life of abstinence, toward a life of abstaining from those sinful desires that, that we all have. Don't you long for that? Don't you long for that kind of experience of community, that kind of deep encouragement and uplifting words and actions of others around you? I do. And I can tell you that in this mostly virtual, highly distanced life of COVID we've been living this last year plus, we're not getting that. We're not getting it the way we need it. We actually need to be person to person. We need to be in each other's presence to get the full sense of that. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm deeply thankful for Zoom and uh, Meets and all other uh, sorts of applications that allow us to actually see each other's faces and to be connected uh, virtually in this time. It's certainly way different than people experienced in the last major pandemic in 1918, but Still, we need each other's presence. And many of us, again, in COVID aren't getting that. Um, and it's clear, it's the way God designed us. It's the way he intended us to, to live and to operate. Uh, the passage I wanted to take a look at today is out of Jeremiah chapter 23. And just a little bit of context. In Jeremiah chapter 23, we find that the, the prophet Jeremiah is writing at a time in Israel's history where the northern kingdom of Israel, 10 tribes, have already been captured. They've been exiled by the Assyrian Empire. And the southern kingdom of Judah, just two tribes remaining, um, has had a series of really bad kings, kings that have been leading them astray, leading them toward idolatry, worshiping other gods, toward uh, just religions that are um, untrue and unhealthy and unfruitful, and certainly turning them away from God's attention, from his heart, for his, from his intentions for the people. And in Jeremiah chapter 23, we see that God is using the prophet Jeremiah to speak this message uh, to the Israelites, but also about these leaders in Israel. So let me read Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 1 to 6. Okay. Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture. So here God is using uh, a very common metaphor for leadership, and that is pa uh, shepherds. And he's using a very common metaphor for those of us who follow him, his people, and that are that is his sheep, right? Uh, and he's referencing these, these kings, these leaders who are leading the people astray. Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what the Lord says, the God of Israel, to the shepherds who tend my people. Because you have scattered my flock, driven them away, and have not bestowed care on them, I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you've done, declares the Lord. I myself 
will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and will bring them back to their pasture, where they will be fruitful and increase in number. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them and who will no longer be afraid or terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord our righteousness. So clearly, there's a number of things in this passage that are really fascinating. But in particular, what draws my attention is this refrain back to something God touches on over and over throughout the scriptures. And that his, his distaste for when his people are scattered, uh, when they're not together, and his love for his people, his care, that shepherding care that he has for his people to be brought back together, to be cared for, to be loved on, to be able to eat, consume together, um, yeah, to just live in each other's presence. We see that all throughout scripture, that God has a deep passion and a care uh, that his people are together. And certainly what we see in this season of COVID is that it has brought upon what many refer to as social distancing, right? Or physical distancing. And we've had to, for safety reasons, we've had to stay apart. But we're coming to a time when it is absolutely time to come back together. And we see in this passage, what God says is that ultimately he will send a Messiah. And we now know that to be Jesus, that Jesus, when he comes, part of his intent, part of what he came to do, accomplish, was to gather God's people back together under his loving care, to be fed by him, to follow his voice, uh, to be cared for and looked after, even protected by him. And also we've seen throughout scripture, the use of, of a shepherd to go out and make sure that there are no lost ones, that there are none that, that wander away and don't get brought back into the fold. So we see that God intended to do that all along and that he accomplished that in many ways through Jesus. And that's something that God desires for each of us is to be together, to be in community, to be encouraging one another, to be strengthened, to, to encourage one another to live in God's fullness, right? Just as we see that picture being so excited and all those people coming around him and encouraging him and excited for him, that he accomplished something really wonderful, pretty unique and, and amazing. Uh, we're intended to live in that kind of community that comes around us and encourages us, that, that draws us closer to God, uh, and that we actually encourage, that we point others toward God, that we, we, we strengthen them as well. That's the kind of community that God calls us into. But COVID, again, has left us feeling distance. I feel that. I imagine, and I know many of you do, I feel a sense of distance. I feel um, some oftentimes in the last year lonely. Uh, I feel isolated, even though I have my family and that's great, don't get me wrong, I love them. And I've loved spending the time that I have and I consider it a blessing to have, have grown closer to my family in this season. Yet I feel very distant from others and um, that's been a disappointment in this season. Even through virtual meetings, it's still, I feel that distance and I long, I long for more. But I'll be honest with you as well, I, I, I feel this sense of inertia. I feel this sense of, boy, this is now the new normal. And, uh, you know, it was hard. It was hard when COVID first struck and feeling that distance happening, uh, trying to adjust, trying to scramble and figure out what does life look like. Uh, so the thought of, of trying to readjust and and make changes again feels overwhelming at times. Um, and I have this sense, as I mentioned, of inertia, of uh, just wanting to just stay where I am. I don't know if you feel that, but I feel it. But I know, I know that God calls his people back, that he wants to go out into the corners of the earth and call the remnant back into relationship, into each other's presence. And that's not gonna happen. 
uh, if we continue to stay distant from one another, even when uh, we're allowed to, even when it's appropriate to, even when we're vaccinated and are safe enough to be in each other's presence, it's not going to happen if we uh, lean into that inertia and lean away from God's invitation to be together again. So let me just encourage you, friends, to uh, pay attention to the voice of God, to pay attention to that invitation of God, to draw together, to seek that kind of community that surrounds us when we throw the no-hitter, that encourage us, uh, even when we don't throw the no-hitter, even when you know we just throw a strike, uh, even when um, one of our other players uh, catches the ball and stops it. That's one, one thing that really stands out to me about that, uh, that, that analogy of the pitcher is that it wasn't just him. Uh, everybody was celebrating him, but they're also celebrating each other because um, he wouldn't have been able to do that by himself. There were balls that were hit that his fielders did a great job of stopping and preventing those people from getting to first base, preventing that hit from actually uh, resulting in an official hit, right? So in the same way, we want to celebrate each other and recognize that it takes a family, it takes a community to, uh, to help us accomplish what God has in store for us. And so I long for that personally. I long for that for all of us, that we would be surrounded by that kind of encouraging community, kind of community that doesn't seek to tear us down, doesn't seek to divide us, doesn't seek to uh, turn us away from God and His intent, but seeks to do all the opposite things, draw us closing to, drawing us closer to God, closer to each other, encouraging and strengthening. So let me just encourage you this summer, as uh, we are rounding this corner, that you would consider how you can take steps uh, back in that direction. You know, maybe it's attending outdoor or when we get back to indoor worship again. Maybe it's, um, you know, maybe it's the smaller step of just telling a friend that you're coming so that you have some accountability there, right? Maybe that's the small step you need to take in order to take the bigger step. Maybe it's joining one of our summer small groups, uh, the Emotionally Healthy, uh, uh, emotionally healthy uh, uh, Spirituality course, or our Sabbath study, or um, it's looking like we may have a Bible study this summer as well. Just signing up for one of those, that maybe that's the step you need to take. It's just signing up for it, right? That's the easier step that leads to the bigger step. Maybe you just need to do that. Maybe you're already engaged. And... Uh, you know, the, the call on you this summer is to look for those people who aren't, look at those people who are distanced still, who uh, feel isolated, and just invite them back in. You know, we all uh, know those people in our lives. Uh, we have an opportunity to invite them back into the fold. So maybe that's, maybe that's the call. Maybe that's the next step for you. I just want to encourage all of us to lean into that, lean into that invitation. And again, maybe it's not going to be a no-hitter every time. Maybe that's not going to be our experience. But the more we take those small steps back into community, into relationship with each other, the more we uh, encourage people in the small things, the more that we're encouraged in the small things, the closer and closer we get to that, uh, that, that, that bigger, no-hitter, encouraging experience. And I, I just pray for that for all of us. So let me close us out. Um, yeah, just praying along those lines. Lord God, would you help each of us as we turn this corner out of COVID and into whatever life is going to look like to overcome the inertia that many of us are feeling? I know I feel would you help us to take those small steps in the right direction or back into relationship? Lord, if it's the simple small step of signing up for something or telling somebody that we're going to meet them somewhere to help us take those bigger steps of actually doing it, then Lord, help us to do that. Help us to take those small steps. Lord, help us to come out of uh, this state of being scattered back into uh, proximate relationship with each other. And Lord, I pray uh, that as we do that, you would reinforce that, Lord, that you would make those experiences sweet and encouraging and strengthening, that we would all uh, experience your love and your joy and, um, 
Yeah, your intent for each of us as we gather together in community again. So, Lord, we bless your purposes. We thank you for your invitation. We thank you for God, for your commitment to uh, our health. And uh, Lord, we thank you that you made us um, to need each other. And we thank you for your promises that when we do come together, Lord, you will be present with us. We will know and we'll experience you. Hmm. So Lord, we thank you. We love you and we ask all these things in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, bless you all. Go be Jesus to the world.